Welcome to the second part of the series of lectures and this is about the physical examination of these ambulatory cerebral palsy patients with gait abnormalities. Because prior to doing your gait analysis you have to first perform a history and a focused lower extremity physical examination with some special tests that I'll go over with you here. So the first thing I do usually is watch the patient walk. Uh, not to do a full gait analysis, but just to get an overall impression of their strength, stamina, and major deformities. Uh, I want to see what their balance is like. And as I mentioned earlier, she's holding her hands out, which may be an underlying problem with balance or may be due to the structural and uh, dynamic deformities that she has. Next we want to categorize what the severity of her CP is and she would be a GMFCS level 2 which we'll go over in just a moment. And then we want to see if she, what type of tone abnormality she has. Is she just purely spastic? Uh, or does she have any degree of ataxia balance problems or athetosis, which is uh, uncontrolled movements. So the GMFCS gross motor function classification system has become an important part of management of patients with cerebral palsy because it gives us a handle on how severe they are. So it goes from the mildest uh, who manifest minimal uh, gait abnormalities and functional abnormalities which are classified at GMFCS level 1 uh, through the most severe uh, who basically demand uh, total care and uh, are unable to uh, uh, even control a power wheelchair. This was developed 20 years ago in 1997 by the group led by Bob Palisano and Peter Rosenbaum and uh, has become a standard which has been replicated by many other investigators. The important thing to remember is that this is not an outcome measure. This is just used to classify patients and, and give you some idea of the degree of impairment that they have. If you want to use a uh, corollary of this, uh, but from the same group, there's a GMPM, Gross Motor Performance Measure, that's also been published that uh, can be used as a, a reliable outcome measure. So after doing this uh, brief sort of introductory examination, we do a more thorough physical examination. And this is the sheet that our gate lab personnel use to uh, record the physical examination findings. And it's really exceedingly useful. Uh, you may not want anything this detailed, but you should have a matrix that you can put the major findings of your lower extremity physical examination into so that if you want to go back to see how a patient's done following an intervention or you want to see whether they've remained the same, deteriorated or improved over time, uh, you have this data here. So that this includes range of motion, strength by standard measures, spasticity, and then other special tests which we're going to go over. So when you measure joint range of motion and muscles for spasticity and strength, uh, to measure the range of motion, use a goniometer. Uh, your estimation is not as accurate as you may think, and if you want reliable data, try and make it more reliable by using an objective measure. So I've been talking about spasticity. What is spasticity? Spasticity is velocity-dependent tone. So as you move a limb through a range of motion, with increasing speed of muscle stretch, uh, there will be a resultant increase in the tone and increased resistance to movement. 
This is frequently manifested as a catch, that is a, a, a bit of a hard stop followed by an ability to slowly extend the joint farther. Contracture, however, is limitation of range of motion of the joint. It's not velocity dependent. There are multiple causes for joint contracture, but it's a limitation of the range of motion through a joint uh, compared to the norm. Rigidity is different than spasticity in that it's increased tone throughout the entire range of movement, which is not influenced by the speed of movement. And this is usually seen in the GMS CS4 and 5 patients who have some degree of dystonia. Spasticity may be quantified using the modified Ashworth scale, uh, which I won't go over in detail, but you can uh, find a reference to, which ranges from zero, which is normal, or no increase in muscle tone, to a four, where the, there is major uh, increase in muscle tone throughout both flexion and extension of a joint. So there are several special tests that we do. The first one is the popliteal angle, uh, here demonstrated by Rosemary Pierce, who was director of the Gate Lab at the Portland Shriners Hospital for many years. And with a hip flexed 90 degrees, the knee is extended, and the popliteal angle is the deficit from full extension when doing this range of motion. And you see this is, she does it slowly here after doing it quickly. So there's a grab indicating spasticity at 90 degrees, but then 45 degrees more of motion until you reach the end of range. And you can see also that this patient has no knee flexion contracture. That is, the knee fully extends when the hip is fully extended. So the difference between the grab at 90 and the end of range at slow stretch at 45 degree popliteal angle is the Tardu angle. And this is known as the Tardu test. And that's a gross measure of spasticity also, uh, like the Ashworth score. So 45 degrees is a significant amount of uh, difference between quick and slow stretch. The next test is the Duncan Ely test, which is an indicator of rectus femoris spasticity. So you see the patient supine on the exam table. Rosemary moves both legs quickly. There's a grab at about 30 degrees, but then end of range at about 90 degrees. But between those two points, you see how the pelvis pops up because the rectus femoris is either short or is dynamically tight and is causing the hip to flex in this fashion. You know that it must be the rectus femoris because the other quadriceps do not cross the hip joint, only the rectus femoris does, and so tightening the rectus femoris uh, will cause this to happen. Here's the same patient postoperatively having her rectus femoris transferred to the iliotibial band. And you can see that she still has a grab uh, at about 30 degrees, indicating some spasticity in the other quadriceps, but her rectus femoris is no longer tight because it, with continued motion, uh, the pelvis does not go up in the air. There's no uh, forced hip flexion. This is actually unusual for patients with cerebral palsy to have tightness in the rest of their quadriceps other than the rectus femoris, but this girl has hereditary spastic paraplegia, uh, so that's why she had tightness in her uh, other quadriceps. Finally, another very important test because it has implications for surgical intervention is the silver shoulder test. Uh, where you have the patient supine, uh, the hip and knee flex to 90 degrees, and then you dorsiflex the ankle to see how much range you can achieve. And here you see this patient has 90 degrees. 
then you gently extend the knee, uh, gently holding the foot in dorsiflexion. And as you progressively extend the knee, as you get to the end of range, the foot will plantar flex uh, dynamically. And some of this dynamic plantar flexion uh, cannot be overcome and the foot will stay in plantar flexion. So that when you have this, this is a positive silver shoulder test and it's indicative of the fact that the gastrocnemius, which crosses the knee joint and therefore is relaxed when the knee is flexed but stretched when the knee is extended, is a major uh, contributor to this plantar flexion deformity that the patient has. In addition to just watching the patient, it's very useful to have a permanent record uh, of their gait, which you can do with a simple video uh, recording. Uh, used to be you had to have a fancy camera, but now pretty much everyone listening to this probably has a handheld device that takes nice movies. Uh, you take these from both the side view, which is the sagittal view, as well as the anterior posterior view, which is the coronal view. And notice the camera is not moving. Um, and it's useful to also be able to have the capacity to review these in slow and stop motion for further analysis. Now, this is two-dimensional information, so that if the knee is turned in, uh, you won't be getting an accurate measure of its flexion extension because it's out of the plane uh, of her gait. Um, but this is something that one has to accept, and this is something that is actually uh, not a problem when you do three-dimensional gait analysis in which the true joint motion is computed. Finally, you can study velocity by timing how long it takes the patient to walk a 10 meter distance uh, by putting two markers on the floor 10 meters apart, having the patient start several steps behind the starting uh, point and continuing to walk several steps after the ending point, but time them just for the 10 meters and then you can calculate their velocity which is a very important parameter for children who want to keep up with their peers. So this brings us an end to the second part uh, and we'll be continuing on with part three.